Okay, continuing our study in the, uh, in the book of Lamentations. It's, uh, as I said, it's not a book we typically study, but uh, I hope you're, you're seeing something of the emotion and power in the book. Uh, when the class, uh, when we finished last week, or when I conclude the, the series, what, I'm, what I plan to do, as I always do, is uh, I'll put all the notes on the website. Now, for those who don't know, here's a website. I have many things on this website. I have uh, over, I, over, I think, 2,000 pages of material on all kinds of, you know, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, on and on, different topical studies, parables. And when I finish this, I will put this study up there, and the notes will include all of the, uh, the material, the introductory material, dealing with uh, Israel's relationship with God from the Exodus uh, to the destruction of Jerusalem. So, uh, you know, I don't, I don't sell advertising space here or anything. I do this and put this up. This is material I've produced over the last 20 years. And I just, you know, I hope it's useful. I put it there for people to, to have access to. If you don't remember the link, if you put in my name and put in the outlet, uh, it'll come up. It may just come up with if you just put in my name. But also all kinds of bad things people say about me will come up, but that's another story. <laughs> Evolutionists don't like me. Uh, <clears throat> all right, now in, in 587, 586 B.C., Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians following an 18-month siege. Many people died during that conquest. Many people were exiled to Babylonia. As a result of that conquest and this absolutely horrible and devastating experience for the people of Judah was God's long-promised punishment for their rebellion. And you remember how we went through uh, all of that and, and showed so clearly how God had told them and told them and told them. And they just continued to ignore him. He sends prophets, tells them, tells them, tells them, forget it, forget it, forget it, forget it. And then God says, all right, judgment is coming. And so we are seeing on the other side of God's judgment, we are seeing, we're hearing from the sufferers of God's judgment, and there's a message in that for us. See, there's a message in that for us. Now, Lamentations, as I've said a number of times, it's a, it's a collection of five poems expressing grief over the destruction of Jerusalem, what happened there. We read chapter one last week, and I'm in the middle of commenting on it the way I thought I'd do it as I'd read the chapter. Since each chapter is a poem, uh, I wanted to read the chapter and then I'll go back through it and just kind of talk about the different verses and say something about them. So that's what we're doing when we finish uh, my comments on chapter one, then I'll read chapter two, then we'll go back and I'll approach that in the same way. Now I think that when we ended, uh, we, were, uh, we just finished verse 14 of chapter one, which says that God turned Jerusalem's transgressions into a yoke upon its neck. In other words, he delivered the city to its enemy for exile because of their sin. He took their trans transgressions, this is poetic language, and he fashioned them into a yoke. You know, you have a yoke of oxen where you have this thing on two of them and they're laboring. And so this was a symbol of exile, that he puts this on there because of their sin and takes them into exile where they'll labor for the Babylonians. And God had done that, fashioned their transgressions, and did that because of their rebellion. So let's pick back up, and in, in, I won't read chapter 1 again, but we'll just continue on, then I'll read chapter 2. In verse 15, we see that verse 15 says that God rejected Jerusalem's fighting men, meaning he chose for them to be defeated. In other words, if, if God was for them, they wouldn't have been defeated. If God chose to fight them, I mean, nobody was going to defeat them. But he rejected them, meaning he chose for them to be defeated, he summoned an assembly, the Babylonian army, to crush them. Jerusalem, it says, was trodden as in a wine press, which in houses where it says represents the crushed resistance and the defender's lifeblood shed like grapes crushed in a wine press. Now that's a pretty powerful image of crushing an enemy. And you see this show up, where does it show up again? Uh, it shows up in one place, it shows up is in Revelation. You see it showing up there. At the end, at the consummation, what do we have? We have 
the grapes of wrath are in the wine press and they're being trampled. And it says in Revelation 14 that the blood is flowing as high as a horse's bridle for 184 miles. And we see in chapter 19 that the one who's doing the treading of the grapes is the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, we cannot lose that picture. We cannot go one-dimensional with God and lose that picture of judgment. And that is coming. And you see it there, the same image here as these people had suffered this idea of of, uh, Jerusalem trodden as in a wine press. Verse 16, Jerusalem sobs over her judgment and there's no one to comfort her. See, those who lived in the city, that's her children, the city's uh, inhabitants. Those who lived in the city likewise are emotionally devastated because the enemy prevailed against them. And as I said uh, last week and a number of times, you have to see something of the emotion of the destruction of this city because this city was the heartbeat of the nation. It symbolized the nation. And as I said, something like Washington. And if you could see a picture of people just on the rubble of the monuments, you know, smoke going up and just somebody saying, you'd have something of the idea and the despair of what, what it meant beyond simply a city. It represented all kinds of things, and now it's just torched. It represents God's judgment and just the loss of, of the nation. So there's, just, there's powerful emotion here. Verse 17 expresses again that there's nobody, no one to help relieve Jerusalem's suffering. See, as part, of, as part of her judgment, she stands isolated and despised by other nations. And this is part of the pain. This is part of the agony. That you are alone, that you have now been, you know, when you're up and thriving, I mean, everybody likes somebody who's rolling. You know, it's like, you know, when you're rolling, you got friends. When you're condemned and burned out, nobody knows you. Nobody knows you. In fact, they they joined with the Babylonians in saying, good job, these people were worthless. You see, and that just adds to the pain of what has happened to them. Verse 18. Verse 18 confesses expressly that God is right to have brought this devastating judgment. This isn't the only time this is said. But you have to see that as we read this and we say, man, this is rough. And the city itself says, this is right. This is right. See, the inspired poet has Jerusalem declare, the Lord is in the right, for I have rebelled against his word. The Lord is in the right for doing this. Of course it's right for him to have done this. It's horrible. It's terrible. We're suffering. Look at our devastation. But the Lord was right to have done it because of the way we treated him. And he told us and warned us and warned us for centuries and appealed to us and we shut our ears to it and pursued the prophets and didn't care. And of course we deserve what he's brought as serious and as devastating as it is he confesses there the lord is right but then the city calls all peoples all the nations to recognize the magnitude of her suffering which includes her young men and women having gone into captivity but here all you people see my suffering it's like the person who's just been you know beaten within an inch of his life look at what's happened to me will you let this register And see the consequence of rebelling against God Almighty. Look at me and learn what is in store for those who rebel against God. And he calls to the nations to observe. Verse 19 acknowledges that when she she called to the nations in which she had trusted for safety all these alliances... They didn't respond. See, contrary to what she'd been led to believe. She was thinking, no, listen, I've got Egypt... You know, we've been, we've been back-channeling with Egypt. That's our word, right? You know, no, we've got back-channel communications going on. Uh, we have, you know, we've talked to these people. Uh, so here's how it'll play out. Uh, they won't dare do that because then they'd have a fight on their hands. They'd have to mess with Egypt. They'd have to, that'll never happen. Okay, so we're secure. These people are going to be our salvation. Well, they didn't respond. The situation in the city, they are deceived by those people. 
In what way? In the fact they were led to believe that they would be their answer, that, they would, that their alliance with them would prevent what was happening. Turns out, when the chips were down, when they needed some, what happened? See you, dude. <laughs> you know, see you. Can't, uh, can't do that. Can't, uh, we see that we can't stand up against them. The situation in the city was so dire that priests and elders starved to death while trying to find food to stay alive. And you can imagine, as I said, you have a siege where the city is shut off. You have people, of course, who have planned for this, but it's 18 months. And then after that, the city is just destroyed. And so what do you think is happening then? The people who are left there, yes, you're, we're going to keep the poorest people here, but what are they going to eat? You see, so it's just you have this picture, and it's not the only time. We'll see it again. You have this picture of starvation. Verse 20 is another expression of suffering directed to God. You see, here's this picture of suffering directed to God. Jerusalem is in distress. Her stomach churns, and her heart is wrung within her. Now, that's pretty powerful emotional statements to get you to see the depth of suffering that is going on in this city. Okay, her heart's wrung within her because as she again confesses, why? Because I have been very rebellious. God appealed to me, gave me all kinds of opportunity, but I rebelled. No, I'm not going to yield. I'm not going to submit. I'm not going to be faithful. I'm not going to be loyal. I'm not going to follow. I'm going to be king. I'm going to live the way I want to do. And now the fruit of that is present. I have been very, I have been very rebellious. Terror and death stalked the city inside the houses as well as in the streets. There is no safe haven. You have disease, people dying from that. You have people being killed in the streets. There's no safe place. You can't go and hide and say, okay, in this flame of God, in this fury of God, that's okay. I'll step into my bubble and I'll be protected. There is no bubble. There is no bubble. And here you see this poet just expressing this and bringing this out. Verse 21 uh, according to verse 21, Jerusalem's suffering has become well known, but the result is rejoicing over what God has done to her rather than comfort. You'd hope that when people heard this, you know, your idea would be that they would be sympathy and that the nations and people go, oh, can, you know, what can we do to help you? How can we? No, no, they're partying. They're partying. Yes, it was well known, but the effect of it or the consequence of it being well known was not comfort. It was people rejoicing over what had happened to them, what had been done to them. She notes that, that uh, God had brought upon her the judgment he had long promised. No secret. Everybody knew it. it wasn't, you know, God had brought on the judgment he had long promised and then asked that he now bring her enemies to account. You see, this is one of the things that says, okay, I have been judged, but I'm not the lone ranger. You see, I'm not the lone ranger. Ask that God bring his enemies to account. And you see this, this appeal of bringing the enemies to account is continued. And it reminds me of, of Habakkuk. You know, the minor prophet Habakkuk. Habakkuk's second complaint in chapter 1, verse 12 through chapter 2, verse 1. He first wants to know, Habakkuk says to God, listen, how can a righteous God continue to tolerate the evil that's going on in Judah? How can it be? How can one righteous and holy and absolute put up with this? Don't you see what's happening? Don't you see how they're treating people? Don't you see the blood? Don't you see the crushing of the poor? What is going on? And God answers and God says, you know, Habakkuk, I got it. I got it. I'm raising up the Babylonians to take care of them. Oh, then he says, wait a minute, how can you possibly punish Judah at the hand of the Babylonians? The Babylonians are worse. He says, I'm going to sit here until you give me an answer. And God has an answer for him. God says, listen, I'm God. I will take care of the Babylonians after they serve me in bringing judgment on Judah. He says, look, you know, you know, this is a big thing. I got it. I'm raising them up. They're going to smoke Judah, and I'll take care of them. And he did. And I see this. You see this idea of crying out for justice, that, listen, I've gotten what I deserve, but will you execute justice on others? And so I, that's, that reminds me. All right, chapter 2. 
Let's read chapter 2, and then I'll go back and comment on it. Second poem. How the Lord in his anger has set the daughter of Zion under a cloud. He has cast down from heaven to earth the splendor of Israel. He has not remembered his footstool in the day of his anger. The Lord has swallowed up without mercy all the habitations of Jacob. In his wrath, he has broken down the strongholds of the daughter of Judah. He has brought down to the ground in dishonor the kingdom and its rulers. He has cut down in fierce anger all the might of Israel. He has withdrawn from them his right hand in the face of the enemy. He has burned like a flaming fire in Jacob, consuming all around. He has bent his bow like an enemy, with his right hand set like a foe. And he has killed all who were delightful in our eyes in the tent of the daughter of Zion. He has poured out his fury like fire. The Lord has become like an enemy. He has swallowed up Israel. He has swallowed up all its palaces. He has laid in ruins its strongholds. And he has multiplied in the daughter of Judah mourning and lamentation. He has laid waste his booth like a garden. Laid in ruins his meeting place. The Lord has made Zion forget festival and Sabbath. And in his fierce indignation has spurned king and priest. The Lord has scorned his altar, disowned his sanctuary. He has delivered into the hand of the enemy the walls of her palaces. They raised the clamor in the house of the Lord as on the day of a, of a festival. The Lord determined to lay in ruins the wall of the daughter of Zion. He stretched out the measuring line. He did not restrain his hand from destroying. He caused rampart and wall to lament. They languished together. Her gates have sunk into the ground. He has ruined and broken her bars. Her king and princes are among the nations. The law is no more and her prophets find no vision from the Lord. The elders of the daughter of Zion sit on the ground in silence. They have thrown dust on their heads and put on sackcloth. The young women of Jerusalem have bowed their heads to the ground. My eyes are spent with weeping. My stomach churns. My bile is poured out on the ground because of the destruction of the daughter of my people. Because infants and babies faint in the streets of the city. They cry to their mothers, where is bread and wine? As they faint like a wounded man in the streets of the city as their life is poured out on their mother's bosom. What can I say for you? To what compare you, O daughter of Jerusalem? What can I liken to you that I may comfort you, O virgin daughter of Zion? For your ruin is as vast as the sea. Who can heal you? Your prophets have seen for you false and deceptive visions. They have not exposed your iniquity to restore your fortunes, but have seen for you oracles that are false and misleading. All who pass along the way clap their hands at you. They hiss and wag their heads at the daughter of Jerusalem. Is this the city that was called the perfection of beauty? The joy of all the earth? All your enemies rail against you. They hiss, they gnash their teeth, they cry. We've swallowed her. Ah, oh, this is the day we long for. Now we have it. We see it. The Lord has done what he purposed. He has carried out his word which he commanded long ago. He has thrown down without pity. He has made the enemy rejoice over you and exalted the might of your foes. Their heart cried to the Lord. O wall of daughter of Zion, let tears stream down like a torrent day and night. Give yourself no rest, your eyes no respite. Arise, cry out in the night. At the beginning of the night watches. Pour out your heart like water before the presence of the Lord. Lift your hands to him for the lives of your children who faint for hunger at the head of every street. Look, O oh Lord, and see. With whom have you dealt thus? Should women eat the fruit of their womb, the children of their tender care? Should priest and prophet be killed in the sanctuary of the Lord? In the dust of the streets, lie the young and the old. My young women and my young men have fallen by the sword. You have killed them in the day of your anger, slaughtering without pity. 
You summoned as if to a festival day my terrors on every side. And on the day of the anger of the Lord, no one escaped or survived. Those whom I held and raised, my enemy destroyed. I don't know about you. When I read this, man, I feel the people. I see the judgment of God. I see the power of God. And I just say, we have to understand this. We have to see this. We have to get a grip on this. And let me go through here and comment on some of the things in here. All right, in chapter 2, verse 1, this second poem, it begins with an exclamation of how God's anger had engulfed Jerusalem like a cloud. See, his wrath is everywhere. It comes in, see, it just comes in and just, it's everywhere. This is the feeling as the poet looks at what has happened to the city. His wrath has engulfed it like a cloud. That city, which was the splendor of Israel, was the exalted sight of God's special presence. In all the earth, all of the globe, where did God choose to make his special presence known? The temple. It was the city. In all the world, God chose to make his special presence known in this city, but God has now cast this city down from its glorious position. It was exalted. It was glorious. It was this wonderful sight. And what has happened to it? Just thrown it right down. From its glory and greatness and grandeur and splendor into the dirt, ashes, destruction, rubble, exile. What has he done? That's the price, the cost, the consequence of rebelling against God Almighty. And he wants them to see and to understand this and make this connection. God didn't remember the city, or more specifically the temple, in the sense that what? He poured out his wrath upon it. He didn't remember it in that sense. He poured out his wrath upon the city. Verse 2 says, God showed no mercy to Judah when he brought his judgment. He swallowed up cities of Judah. All right, you can just see this picture. Just swallowed up the cities of Judah, broke down the strongholds of Jerusalem, and brought down in dishonor the kingdom and its rulers. You know, here we were, a, a magnified nation, a great city. People traded with us. They came to us. We had festivals. We were a player on the international stage. Our kings and rulers held their heads high. You know, like you can see a picture meeting of the UN. You got all these, all these people bopping around, you know. Well, I'm from the great nation of Israel or Judah. And, you know, I'm here and we have the great city and all this stuff. Just done. Just done. And so he tells them, listen, that he brought down and dishonored the kingdom and its rulers. Verse 3, God cut down the might of Israel by withdrawing his protection from them. You see, and, th and thus allowing them to be steamrolled by the Babylonians. If God had fought against the Babylonians, what would have happened? The same thing that happened to the Assyrians. When the Assyrians in 701 B.C. under Hezek when King Hezekiah ruled, what happened? Well, they're out there, and well, God didn't want them to take Jerusalem. So what did he do? He killed 185,000 of them. So what do you, you see, so God, the fact that Nebuchadnezzar took the city, it said, God said, okay. Have at it. Go ahead. Take them. Do what I've summoned you to do. So he cut down the might of Israel by withdrawing their protection, allowing them to be steamrolled, and he consumed the nation like fire. That's a serious picture, isn't it? Fire breaking out. You know, you think of cities like in, the, in this country in, the, in days when you had so many wood structures, the Chicago fire and other fires. You think back longer, the fire in Rome in the first century, where these things could go and just, just consume. You see, and God here, his picture, he says that he consumed the nation like a fire. Verse 4 acknowledges that it was God who, through the instrumentality of the Babylonians, shot the arrows and killed people's loved ones. God would never do that. God cares too much about people to do that. God judged this nation. And he says that who's pulling the bow? It is God through the instrumentality of the Babylonians. He summoned them. He raised them up. He was going to judge Judah. He told them long ago, if you rebel against me, if you're unfaithful to me, 
If you go and whore around, what will happen? A nation will come. A nation you don't know, whose language you don't understand, will come and destroy you. And that's what happened. But it is God who is doing this through the Babylonians. See, he shot the arrows. He killed those who were precious in their sight. It was his fury that killed the people's loved ones. His fury burned against them like a fire. Now, we don't like talking about God like that. We don't like talking about the warrior God who comes in justice, who comes in judgment. But I got a, I got a tip for you. Read that white horse in Revelation 19. Who's coming? You see, this image doesn't go away. It doesn't go away. His robe is dipped in blood. What do you think that means? <laughs> he is trotting the wine press. He's defeating the enemy. He's pouring out his wrath on those who chose not to join him. Well, that's what happened here. They chose, we're not going to be your people. No, we're going to be our own thing. God says the consequence of that will be judgment, destruction, suffering, punishment, heartache, sorrow, all of that. No, no, no. Don't believe it, don't believe it, don't believe it, don't believe it. Oh, you always say that kind of stuff. Oh, <laughs> that's good. I've been hearing that same song for a long time. Okay. Well, now we're seeing it from the side of one who went through it. That's what I think is part of the power of the book. Is that we're getting this account of what happened. Okay, you have in verse 5, verse 5 says that God became like an enemy. In executing his judgment by means of the Babylonians, he swallowed up the nation and its palaces and he destroyed its strongholds. You know this idea, no, we've, nothing's going to happen to us. We've got this great wall. We're a very well fortified place, very difficult to get. In fact, we'll see later, people didn't think it could be taken. You see, obviously Nebuchadnezzar did. <laughs> but it's like, can, can you really, if we don't surrender, if we hold out, can you really Take us by force. No, no, we got these great strongholds. We have all these kinds of things, you see. But God, they swallowed up the nation, its palaces, destroyed all its strongholds. And his punishment, what? It resulted in great mourning and lamentation in Judah. Just great sorrow. If you've lost somebody, somebody you cared about, you know the pain of mourning, of loss. This, this calling out, this lamenting. And he says that he multiplied this in Judah. This is grim. But it, we need to see it as grim. You see, we need, to, we need to recognize it and see it that way. He says verse 6 refers to the fact that God's judgment included the destruction of the temple, his booth. See, God's dwelling. It was leveled and devoid of, human, of, and devoid of habitation like a garden. You see, I think that's the image here, where he sits here and says, you know, you had all these structures and evidence of habitation here. We just took it out and leveled it. Just like if you looked out. Just taken down. That was his temple. God's temple was destroyed. And in doing so, Yahweh brought to an end the annual festivals and the Sabbath observances, which included burnt offerings in the temple. And so in destroying the temple, he took those things out. But he didn't spare, he didn't spare the temple that this is a place of protection. In his fierce indignation, God showed contempt for king and priest alike. What did he do? He expelled them from the city into exile. It's not like, okay... Uh, no, 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 you're an honored, uh, no, you're the king, no, we can't, we can't touch the king, he's too high. If he's destroying his temple, do you think he's leaving alone the king and the priest? No. Whoosh. They went away into suffering, into exile, into captivity. The point is reinforced in verse 7 that God disowned his altar and his sanctuary. The very place of his special presence, the holy of holies, that God said, I manifest myself here like no other place. He just rejected it. He just wound up, he, he rejected it, he disowned it. 
He delivered the temple into the hands of the Babylonians. And the sound of that pagan army celebrating in the Lord's temple, it epitomized God's judgment on Judah. Can you picture that? Can you picture having been a Jew raised in that city, understanding the holiness of the temple, and then to hear the Babylonian army celebrating in the Holy of Holies? Throwing up cheers, no doubt profanities, cursing. Well, that would be a clue to you. Uh-oh. God has turned, turned on us and is punishing us. He has turned, he is not sparing his own temple, his own sanctuary. And so here they're celebrating there, and you can just imagine what that felt like. Verse 8, it emphasizes it was the Lord who determined to destroy Jer Jerusalem. This wasn't simply the result of Babylonian imperialism. You see, if you look from the outside, somebody could say, well, I'm sure this is his historians, you know, they, they wouldn't account for anything like God. You see these naturalistic types. Oh, no, no, what happened? Well, obviously Nebuchadnezzar, you know, he was this and that, and uh, it was all him because of the rebellion that had happened. So you would have a naturalistic explanation. And God is saying to us in Scripture, don't fall for that. You see, don't fall for that. I am the one who chose to destroy and I use the instrumentality of the Babylonians. You see, he determined to destroy him. It wasn't because of the Babylonians. God measured the city for calamity. Like you're measuring somebody for a suit. He measured them for calamity. He was the one who took their measure. What he was going to do to them. It was he who caused the city's defenses, rampart and wall to grieve over their collapse. So they had these great defenses. We've got ramparts. We've got the wall. We're, we're good. What happened to them? Collapsed. And so, of course, in the poetic language, they're grieving their collapse. These inanimate objects of defense. Well, who caused that? God did. God caused the city to collapse there. Those defenses to collapse. Verse 9 says, The gates of Jerusalem were broken and sunk in the ground. Just completely taken down. The city was bereft of kings and princes, those surviving being in captivity. And there was no law in the sense there were no priests giving priestly instruction. And in the time that's referred to in this lament, whatever prophets were left in Jerusalem found no vision from the Lord to direct the people. So in the time he's referring to, whatever prophets were there in the city found no vision from the Lord to direct the people. You recall that Jeremiah lived in Mizpah after Jerusalem's fall. And then he was later taken to Egypt after Gedaliah was murdered. And so here it's just a picture of, listen, here we are sitting in rubble. We have no direction. We're just sitting here just the, reaping the consequences of our rebellion against God Almighty. And the poet wants you to feel that. He doesn't just want you to read it. He wants you to feel it emotionally as he paints this picture of what does it mean to rebel against God. Oh, I know what it means. It means this. He wants you to go beyond that and say, I want you to feel what it means. I want you to go, man, this is something that only a crazy person would do. Only a crazy person. Let's sit there and say, hey, what do I care about God? I have no, no, I'm not thinking about my future. I'm not thinking about God. I'm going to live the way I want. I'm going to take no account of him. Well, that's what these people are experiencing. The consequence of exactly that concept and that course of action. Now, the tremendous grief of the remaining people is portrayed in verse 10. From the elderly family leaders to the young virgins, every element of society suffered under God's wrath. You have these elderly family leaders. You have the young virgins. The elders sit in silence among the rubble, wearing sackcloth and sprinkling dirt on their head. And we say, what's that about? Those were standard uh, signs of mourning. Standard mourning practices in the ancient world. Sackcloth and putting dirt on your head. So you just, just picture this. This once great city, rubble, fires over here, just destroyed. And here are the elders of the city. The old people sitting on heaps of rubble in sackcloth, just miserable. Heart just broken. Just suffering because of what has happened. 
Because what God has done rightfully, justly, for their rebellion against him. The virgins bow their heads to the ground, overcome by grief and humiliation. Here they are just, you see, it's none of, none of this. You know, I'm styling. I got attitude. None of that. Just completely. And he wants you to see it. He wants you to understand this and feel it. The poet's own grief is expressed in verse 11. He has cried until he can cry no more. He's just completely spent in crying. Have you ever had that happen? Have you ever cried so much about something that you can't cry anymore? This is it. And here is the poet expressing that. His insides are churning. And he literally says that his liver is cast down to the ground. That strikes us as bizarre. But see, the liver was considered and seen as the seat of emotions, which is why some English translations turn that around and they use heart, because that resonates with us. We have, we have the same kinds of pictures. You see, his heart was cast down. But the point of it seems to be that, you know, that he's feeling as low as one can feel because of the destruction and the tremendous suffering that has gone with it. He's as low as one can feel when he says, my heart, or literally my liver, is cast down. And one example of, what he, of the consequences that have gone with this destruction is the example of that infants and babies faint in the streets for lack of food. Is there anything rip your guts out more than that? Right? You see a little child suffering? Man, you're going to be going, oh, I can't do anything. There, there's nothing I can do. This is the fury. This is the wrath. There's suffering, and you can see why he cried his heart out. Verse 12, he adds that the little ones cry out for sustenance as they collapse in the street like wounded men, and as they die in their mother's embrace. Food? Can you give me some food? I can't. I have no food to give you. I have nothing to give you. We have rebelled. We have rebelled against God. And we are reaping the consequences of our rebellion. God is smoking us, my word, without pity. And it's just, uh, uh, I mean, when I look at this, verse 13, it expresses the degree of Jerusalem's suffering by suggesting it's incomparable. Her devastation, loss, pain, and sorrow are beyond comprehension. That's, this, is, this is what we're suffering. Her, her ruin is so great, as vast as the sea. Poetic picture, right? Her ruin is so great as vast as the sea that she's beyond healing. Certainly beyond healing by any human plan or wisdom or effort. God has just taken us out. We can't resist Him. We can't in our wisest endeavors, our most powerful organization, we can't resist what God has ordained for our rebellion. All we can do is endure it. There's a message in that. There's a reason this book is in the Bible. There is a reason God wanted us to read this book. And I'm giving you clues to what I think those reasons are. And of course, when we finish, I'll say that more explicitly. Verse 14 puts a large measure of blame for Jerusalem's suffering on the false prophets. A large measure of the blame on the false prophets who presented as the word of God reassuring lies to the people about their relationship with God. They're, no, 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 no. We're okay. No, no, no. We're good. We're good. 
Didn't I just see people sacrificing their children? Don't I see them offering all these idols? Don't I see them spilling innocent blood? Don't I see them living contrary to everything God said? What do you know? Thus saith the Lord, you're cool. See? What does God say? He puts a large measure of blame on them. See, rather than exposing people's sin that they might repent and be restored to God, these so-called prophets, they chose to be what? What we would call politically correct. That's what they chose to be. They chose to give the people what they wanted to hear rather than the truth they needed to hear. Medicine isn't always good. The Word of God isn't always comforting. Sometimes it's rebuking. Sometimes it's challenging. You have to hear it. And they didn't do it. And he says to them, look. Just see him holding up these false prophets' faces and saying, look. This is the consequence. We have to teach the Word of God. Okay? Has to be done. Because people need it and people die for the lack of it. I heard that bell. Thanks. <laughs>